and then introduce the moderator. And hopefully by then, this problem will be solved. But who knows? Anyway. Good afternoon. Or oh, actually, yeah, it's now afternoon. And I'm Arian Mack, and I'm a professor in the psychology department at the New School for Social Research, and editor of Social Research, which is the journal of the New School for Social Research. It started in 1934 by the first faculty, graduate faculty, at the New School, which was composed of the uh, intellectuals, intellectuals and scholars, German, who were rescued by the first president of the New School, Alvin Johnson, from the uh, impending savagery that was about to occur and was occurring in Germany and then in Europe more broadly. And he brought many people out of Europe uh, and some of them stayed at the New School and became in 1934, what, 33, what was called the University in Exile. And the University in Exile, the following year, became the graduate, became a degree granting, PhD granting program, and was called the Graduate Faculty of Political and Social Sciences. Some, for reasons I never understood, um, much more recently, it became uh, the New School for Social Research uh, at the New School. But, and so that is what it's currently called. The, uh, that initial University in Exile faculty with uh, the first president, Alvin Johnson, felt that there needed to be a public voice of the, the uh, graduate faculty. And so that is the reason they actually started social research, which uh, the journal, the New School for Social Research, that has been publishing four times a year ever since. I've been editor for a very long time of the journal. And at some point, it actually in uh, the late 80s, it, it, it occurred to us that uh, we needed a more public voice than we had. And so we started. Uh, our conference series uh, with the first conference, which took place in 1988 at the New School and was called In Time of Plague, The History and Social Consequences of Lethal Epidemic Diseases at the moment of the AIDS hysteria that was then uh, uh, dominating the news and the world in which we all lived. So, and we've been doing conferences ever since. This is the 36th conference. Uh, some years ago, um, not long, uh, we, the New School agreed to create for us something that is now called the Center for Public Scholarship, which I direct. I also am the editor of Social Research, and I direct the center. And the mission of the center is quite close to the mission of the journal itself, namely to deal with uh, issues, uh, particularly the conferences, with issues that have some current uh, uh, meaning or importance, and uh, to deal with them, to use a word that is now uh, not so uh, uh, desirable, but yet we believe is desirable, from, into, from many different perspectives within the academy and with, outside the academy. And so it was meant to be truly what is called interdisciplinary. And uh, we, we've been doing conferences. This is the 36th conference, all of which are funded. This one, we are very grateful to the Sloan Foundation for uh, the funding of this conference. We would not have done this conference without that funding. And we, of course, are also grateful to all the uh, speakers who have agreed to speak. And I am deeply grateful to Liz Farley and the uh, students who work with Liz. To who, um, Liz manages the Center for Public Scholarship. And there would be no conference without Liz. We not only need money, we need Liz. I need Liz. So, uh, I am uh, deeply grateful to have Liz in my life. She's the person who's been trying to make, uh, get the 
technology to uh, people to fix the technology. Also, under the auspices of our Center for so uh, Public Scholarship is not only social research, but it's also, it, it's several other things as well. One of them I just want to mention to you, which is a project titled Endangered Scholars Worldwide. And we, it has an active website, and what the purpose of it is, is to call attention to the many scholars around the world who are under threat, in prison, out of uh, work because of uh, possibly for political reasons, usually for political reasons, and there are many. And as m most of you know right now, the scholarly world is, is under attack pretty much everywhere in Turkey hundreds and hundreds of academics have been fired, and that will only get worse since the Turkish election this past week. Uh, the Central European University, which was the university started in Budapest by George Soros, has now been uh, closed by the Turkish parliament, uh, which is uh, obviously another gross attack on uh, scholarship and freedom of inquiry. And our, the, the, our website uh, tries to bring attention to all of this and, to, and we ask people who come visit our website to send uh, prepared or their own letters of protest and we, to the authorities who happen to be the relevant authorities uh, given whoever the endangered academic is. And so I, I urge you to do that, if, if you think of it, is to visit that website and help protest what's going on in, uh, around the world to academics. So let me now, uh, a little bit I'm killing time in the, in the hope that uh, the technology will get fixed. So. Uh, So you know what today's conference is about. It's in, uh, about invisibility uh, and the many roles it plays in our lives. <clears throat> the concept is, I think, extremely powerful. It is extremely per pervasive and multifaceted. It is paradoxically even double-edged, affording the possibility of, a great, of great power as well as the complete absence of power. It is both magical and a spur to scientific experimentation and exploration. In the sciences, it is evident in the development of technologies that allow us to find new evidence of the invisibly small or the invisibly distant, like uh, planets and different so, uh, solar systems. It is also painfully visible in our social lives where there are whole groups of people who are invisible to us. Uh, people who are marginalized and, and essentially uh, we don't see from, from the homeless uh, who live on the streets of New York to many other groups. Uh, uh, you all know this. And of course in the social sciences it, is, uh, it has played a, a serious role. Just think of uh, the invisible hand uh, in economics. Uh, and in uh, the humanities and in philosophy, there's the, uh, the, the myth of Gaiji's ring, uh, which if you were invisible, essentially the, the, the issue it raises, is if you were to be invisible, would you still be good? Uh, if you couldn't be seen doing evil things, would you, uh, so it, it, the invisibility it, it figures very largely in that, uh, the di dialogue by Plato, it obviously plays a part in theological thinking. It's everywhere. When you start thinking about it, as we did when we were organizing this, it is everywhere. So, okay, joining us today, beside our wonderful speakers uh, in this first session, is the moderator of today's session, for first session, Dan Kavlis. He's a very distinguished historian of science, who recently retired from a professorship in Yale, having spent many years before that at Caltech. His research and writings encompass the uh, interplay of science, technology, and society past and present. 
He is the author and co-author of many books, the best known of which is probably The Baltimore Case, A Trial of, I may, I may be right about that, I'm not sure. The Baltimore Case, A Trial of Politics, Science, and Character, which won the, for which he won the Watson Davis Prize in the History of Science. He is spending this academic year as a visitor at NYU, NYU and Columbia Law Schools. It is my pleasure to hand him the microphone and hope the thing is working. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, second period apology for the uh, lateness of the start. Uh, I'm sure for, uh, the uh, expectation will reality before the user expectation. We have a wonderful uh, area of four, oh, sorry, of four speakers. I forgot that area is shorter than I am. Uh, four speakers this morning, uh, one of whom is not here, uh, and I will uh, stand in for him. Uh, the subject of the conference, and of particularly of this session, is uh, wonderfully uh, rich, uh, as Arian suggested. Uh, I would only add to what she said that uh, we encounter invisibility every day uh, in, our, in our own lives, uh, both in the small and in the large. We encounter visibility in the form of the gremlins that uh, uh, right now are plaguing the technology of the PowerPoint uh, and that uh, be, beleaguer us in the use of our, com our personal computers. Uh, we also uh, encounter invisibility in the very large uh, in regard to things that are willfully kept from us, uh, as in the case of President Trump's tax returns. So uh, without further ado, I want to uh, get on uh, with uh, our session. Uh, and uh, I am going to uh, speak for uh, Gerald Holton, whom I know is, for many years as Jerry Holton. Uh, <coughs> He is the uh, professor of. Thank you very much. He is the professor of physics and of history of science at Harvard University Emeritus. His services for academic institutions include the presidency of the History of Science Society and founding editor of the quarterly journal Daedalus. His book publications include the thematic origins of scientific thought, Einstein, history, and other passions. The Scientific Imagination, Science and Anti-Science, and Victory and Vexation in Science, Einstein, Bohr, Heisenberg, and others. His, the title of his talk today, as you, um, I expect, know from the program, is Our Puzzling Universe from a Promising Beginning to Forbidden Knowledge. Uh, <clears throat> so here is what Jerry asked me to tell you. In the beginning, there was only darkness. Many hold that God created the heavens and earth while, there were still in, while they were still invisible, before light was commanded to exist. Others maintain that the cosmos emerged from the Big Bang, with radiation appearing only some 400,000 years later. But both religion and science agree at least to this. At the origin, invisibility reigned as darkness was on the face of the deep. Eventually, atoms and molecules assembled themselves <clears throat> and could radiate light, permitting our understanding from the study of gargantuan galaxies to the grasping of tiniest particles. Yet, Professor Holton's purpose here is to report that at the end of this huge arc of history, we have come upon a deeply disturbing realization. At a most fundamental level, physical phenomena turn out to be invisible. There are, and implacably so. There, within prescribed limits, we have to embrace the unimaginable and unknowable. Knowledge of how the world works in the most intimate detail is forbidden, hidden forever in darkness. To explain, uh, Professor Holton uh, insist on starting uh, with the atom. <clears throat> it was initially merely the part of the thematic presupposition 
without any direct evidence that the universe is made only of atoms and the void. One stands in awe <coughs> of the passionate pursuit of this dangerous idea for well over 2,000 years. An important question remains. What were these invisible atoms like? Did they always hang together in swarms, or did matter consist of individual atoms and molecules? This question was solved by Jean-Baptiste Perrin, the French physicist. His Nobel Prize award for this work, presented to him in 1926, prominently contained the word atom in the sense that we understand it now that is, as a discontinuous or discrete structure. At long last, the dangerous idea of antiquity from Leucippus, Democritus, Lucretius, and their pupils officially emerged less than a century ago from a passionate fantasy to a provable, demonstrated fact. Of course, physicists had for decades <clears throat> begun to use model, models of the individual atom. A striking example was Niels Bohr's famous paper of 1913, where the, the Dane, then 28, <coughs> explained how hydrogen emits its spectral lines at their different measurable frequencies. To this end, he proposed a plausible and simple image of an arrangement of the electron's orbits around the nucleus, mimicking the Newtonian planetary system. From the mental model, Bohr deduced the existence of the observable frequencies of the emitted and absorbed spectral lines. We all can immediately imagine both displays, Bohr's atoms, atom, and Newton's planetary system, for each has the important property of being intuitively apprehensible. Bohr's model, as he pointed out, corresponded to the observed frequencies of the lines only to within an uncertainty of a few percent. But soon it was extended and modified to be much closer to the experimental data. Indeed, the search for perfection for the infinitely detailed knowledge of physical phenomena is an important key to the mindset of most scientists. One of Professor Holton's colleagues, the first physicist Gerald Gabriels, has, I'm sorry, the fine physicist Gerald Gabriels, has devoted years to the experimental measurement of the magnetic moment of the electron. His latest value <clears throat> has an agreement of theory and experiment within an uncertainty of one part per trillion. And more studies are in progress. For this tribe, it is a solemn duty to reach to certainty, Professor Holton has that capitalized, beyond any previously known uncertainty with a capital U. Einstein said repeatedly that the overwhelmingly important task of science is to achieve a gesamt auf sum, auf, uh, I'm sorry, a gesamt auf asum, a complete understanding without any in principle inscrutable or unresearchable limit. At this point, as many of you may have guessed, we must turn to the work of a young scientist in the 20s, a triumphant rebel, Werner Heisenberg. He had excelled in his humanistic gymnasium years in, for years in Munich, especially impressed by Plato's philosophy, but of course also having his copy in hand of Immanuel Kant. While studying for his doctorate, he attended a grand occasion in 1923, arranged for a visit of Niels Bohr. Bohr was being honored for his further advances in quantum physics, far beyond his original paper. For young Werner, it was a life-changing occasion where Bohr got to talk to him, recognized his brilliance and potential, and eventually invited him to his own institute in Copenhagen. There, Heisenberg became Bohr's student, his collaborator, and in a way, his adopted son. As Heisenberg often told, in June 7th, on June 7th, 1925, he had a fateful epiphany. He had gone alone to a barren North Sea island <clears throat> to, an escape, to escape an attack of hay fever, intending both to work on quantum physics calculations and to learn by heart some of the poetry of Goethe. As he later wrote, when the final result of the calculation lay before me, a deeply shaking experience occurred, 
for it seems to, as if it seemed as if the electron will no longer move in orbits. This was contrary to the old atomic model of his patron Bohr. And in addition, yet another part of the old faith had to be put aside, the reign of the Kantian demand for intuitive visibility. This occurred in, Heim in Heisenberg's famous groundbreaking publication of 1927. There he showed that from this new point of view, one needs to face in atomics an ungenauigkeit, a word best rendered as inexactitude, but which is usually translated as uncertainty or indeterminacy. Words that since then have entered discuss discussions ranging from science to philosophy and popular talk. Indeed, as David Cassidy, Heisenberg's biographer, has put it, the, con the concept helped to fundamentally alter our understanding of nature and our relation to it. Heisenberg next reminds us of the fact that classical physical theory, that is pre-quantum, depended on its ability to be intuitively perceptible, as for example, to fully determine both the body's velocity and its position in space at any given time. But in the interaction of bodies of atomic or even smaller sizes, this is not possible. He notes that in such cases, it is, quote, senseless to speak of the velocity at a certain place. Therefore, it appears necessary to revise the old classical notions. For our purposes here, Heisenberg's key finding in this article is his new vision as usually presented, that for a very small object, so, uh, object, the simultaneous determination of its position x and its momentum p is only possible within an uncertainty, physicists call it delta, from the Greek letter, the uncertainty of each. Moreover, these two uncertainties have a specified relationship to each other. As many readers may well remember, in algebraic terms, one writes the respective uncertainties as delta x and delta p, and the product of the two as delta x times delta p. But the great new message is that this product of the two uncertainties is always equal to or greater than a constant of nature, one that has a very small value, h, which is Planck's constant, h over 4 pi, but large enough for this principle to show up in determinations in the atomic and subatomic realms. But there are two consequences for all this from our perspective, each very significant. One obviously is that since the two uncertainties are multiplied, it follows that as one of them increases, the other correspondingly decreases, so as to keep their product constant. Thus, if either x or p were known with certainty, that is, with zero uncertainty, the other's uncertainty would have to be correspondingly infinitely large. So unlike in ordinary life, at the submicroscopic level, we cannot know the answer to a simple fundamental question. That is, what exactly is a certain object's velocity or momentum at a given point? There exists not just a veil of nature behind which phenomena may or may not exist, it is a non-visualizable, unimaginable region. Any question about it makes no sense, is simply forbidden. That is, to know simultaneously, with exactitude, both the momentum and the position of a particle. <clears throat> And the uncertainty question, or I'm sorry, and this uncertainty principle is, of, is of also, also, of course, contrary to the previous triumphant search for every last detail of physical phenomena. As Heisenberg once put it in a letter to me, that is Professor Holton, physical theory used to allow you to ascertain what can be known. However, his new theory showed what is not possible to know. So if you ask what the world is made of, I can reply, atoms and radiation, and a whole zoo of elementary particles and dark energy and dark matter of which we know only the names. But it is also made up, it also comprises unresolvable 
ignorance. Moreover, the uncertainty relation is not limited only to the very small. It is useful in that region and less and less so for larger objects. But it is a general law of nature, and so in principle it applies to you and me too. We need not be alarmed by it, but the data of our motion or location are in principle always surrounded by a margin of invisibility, a ghostly cloak of darkness. So from now on, remember that you carry an aura of invisibility that surrounded even God at the beginning. On behalf of Professor Holton, thank you. <laughs> Are the slot or the, is the PowerPoint working? Doesn't look no. like it. Should okay. I go ahead anyway? Uh, well, let's give it one more time, okay? Because it's what time do you have to leave? One ish. One, one ish. <laughs> do you want to try? Yeah. Okay. You better go. Okay. Okay. So our okay. next speaker. Is an adapter. Pardon? Problem is with the projector. Well, earlier it was working. Our conference this morning, our session this morning, is suffused with uncertainty. So <laughs> you'll have to forgive us between Priyanatarajan's uh, uh, tight schedule, the Gremlin, and the uh, PowerPoint technology, uh, and so on. So. It gives me great pleasure to introduce my friend and former colleague at Yale. Uh, we know her as Priya Natarajan. Uh, she's a professor in the Department of Astronomy and Physics. She has been credited with several key calculations pertaining to the life cycle of supermassive holes in the universe, including the discovery of the existence of an upper mass limit for black holes. Her efforts to map and detail the spatial distribution of dark matter and cosmic structures, exploiting the phenomena, phenomenon of gravitational lensing and her use of clusters of galaxies in order to better understand dark matter and dark energy. Her most recent book, Mapping the Heavens, a Radical Scientific Ideas that Reveal the Cosmos, followed her earlier book, The Shapes of Galaxies and Their Dark Holes. She is deeply absorbed with uh, bringing to public not only attention, but understanding uh, the kind of work uh, that she does. She indeed is very committed to the public dissemination of science and is currently a member of the Science Advisory Board for the public television series, NOVA. And I have high confidence uh, and look forward with great pleasure to uh, hearing her explain everything that she does. <laughs> say what a real pleasure, honor, and privilege it is to have the opportunity to speak here. Um, unfortunately, I won't be able to show you the visuals, but what I'm going to do, um, I realize, is that I'm going to open that up on my screen and try to recreate for you what you would have seen um, if, the, uh, uh, if the laptop projector had worked. So um, in the natural sciences, um, historically we've had a tradition of invoking invisible entities. But these entities were often placeholders, um, placeholders for ignorance. So this seems rather natural because it serves as an intellectual provisional conceptualization or understanding awaiting further uh, breakthroughs. So there's been, for example, the concept of miasma, you know, as an explanation for the vectors of disease before we had the germ theory of diseases or the pathogenic theory of diseases. Then there was phlogiston, which was the placeholder for oxygen, uh, until Priestley discovered oxygen. And these, of course, were discarded when our understanding got more refined. However, um, 
I would like to argue that these, the use of invisible entities is somehow fundamentally linked to how we have made sense of the universe, how we have formulated structurally laws in the universe, and the laws that govern forces, and therefore the whole idea of mediation of forces through some invisible particles. So here I want to make a small, um, dis I want to distinguish entities that I'll be talking a little bit about um, in a few minutes that are essentially invisible and ones that are invisible limited by our technological capabilities. I mean, to jump off what uh, Professor Holton talked about, there's, a, there's an essential uncertainty in the measurements that you can make and you, know, you can make better and better instruments but there's a fundamental limit that you absolutely cannot uh, bridge. And um, I want to argue that some of the in, uh, invisible entities, like the ones I'm going to talk about, that, for example, the primary constituents of our universe, we now believe, are dark matter and dark energy. And, but these are different from miasma and phlogiston, and in fact, ether even. So there was a concept of luminiferous ether, which was debunked in uh, the late 1800s. And this was supposed to be this sort of fluid. And you know, from classical times, there was the idea it was called quintessence. And the idea was that this was a fluid that mediated, that was offered the medium akin to sound. It was believed that light would need a medium to travel, and therefore this was the medium for light, as well as the way the mediator for gravity. So Newton's laws describe what the gravitational force is, what the strength of that force is in terms of uh, the masses of objects and the relative distance between them. But what Newton did not give us was an explanation for gravity. It was, so how, how do these two bodies that are separated by some distance, how do they actually feel each other? Right? So what was invoked was an invisible mediator, something that transports this knowledge or the force. And with Maxwell's theory and the formulation of electric and magnetic fields, so the concept of a field which is very fundamental. It's a fundamental way, um, structurally, it's fundamental to physics. And by definition, most fields are invisible. And that's sort of how we've structured and formulated descriptions of how laws actually operate um, in the physical world. So this formulation of laws in terms of forces, right? this kind of conceptualization sort of inevitably opens up the space for invisible actors. Right? And some of these invisible actors, um, as I said, when our understanding improves, have just proven to be placeholders and we have a, a better, more concrete description. But, and so these invisible entities serve a very important epistemic purpose. They sort of set the limits of what we currently know, as well as the frontier of what really needs to be contested, what needs to be pushed. And it's very interesting because when you think about the, um, whether you think about the invisible hand of the market, you think about all the sort of other invisible entities that we encounter, they're fundamentally not that different. Um, you know, um, is what um, I want to argue here. And, and so, I'm, so what I'm going to try to convince you is that our current invisible entities that dominate the composition of the universe, that is dark matter, dark matter is, forms the bulk of the matter that structures our universe. So more than 95% of the matter content of our universe is what we believe to be an exotic particle that has mass but does not emit or absorb light and, or reflect it for that matter. It only deflects light. Okay? And in fact, we infer the presence of this dark matter indirectly through the effect, the gravitational effect that it exerts on the motions of bodies in its vicinity, as well as the deflection of light, this phenomenon known as gravitational lensing. In addition to dark matter, we also believe 
uh, and this is something that was discovered very recently in 1998, that the, our universe is not only expanding, as the astronomer Hubble discovered in the 1920s, but that this expansion today is actually accelerating. And the force, the, the agent that is driving this acceleration, we call that dark energy, and its nature is, not, is unknown. All we know about dark energy is what it does. So it's a very classical invocation of invisible entities in physics. And we have not yet, uh, we don't have a theory, a convincing theory of what this dark energy is. What we know is phenomenologically when it starts to be important in the universe, so it gets important <coughs> in the last six to seven billion years in the 13.8 billion year history of the universe, sort of takes off in terms of importance and is driving the accelerating uh, expansion that we see. So, um, and you know, an, another, of, I mean, one could argue that, you know, another invisible entity which has, shares the same kinds of attributes that I've been talking about for dark matter and dark energy are black holes. And once again, black holes by construction are not visible, however, they exert the strong gravity possessed by black hole, exerts influence in its vicinity that we now have measurements of that we can actually detect. And, and I think I would argue that perhaps when we look at these three invisible entities that play an important role in the universe, dark matter, dark energy, and black holes, I would single out dark <coughs> energy to be somewhat different compared to dark matter and uh, black holes. And the reason for that is that when you look at the evidence for either the existence of dark matter or black holes, um, we actually find that there are many independent lines of evidence that suggest um, that these entities are real um, and that they exist. And in the case of dark energy, what we don't really know, it's different in the sense that more attributes of its essential nature are poorly understood at the moment. So for example, we know that dark matter actually has to be a particle. Of course, you know, in all of this, what is uncomfortable is we have not yet discovered the dark matter particle. That you know, whatever that particle might be, despite searches, indirect searches, and direct searches at CERN, we have not yet actually figured out what that particle is, what is the responsible particle. And, and I think that what, what um, this, the point intellectually where we are at at the moment is that the dark matter particle, I believe, might be found any day now, uh, hopefully in the next decade. And, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic uh, because what has happened recently is that um, as a community, we've been fixated on one particular candidate, rather like the drunk under the lamppost. And now there have been some new calculations. There's, there are two categories of particles that are convincing um, candidates for dark matter. One of them is called um, WIMPs, weakly interacting mass of particles, and the other, are called, other category of particles are called axions. And we had all been fixated on a particular kind of web called a neutralino, and that's what we've been sort of gearing, looking, looking for, targeted looking for it. But now there's been a recent breakthrough in, um, in the axion sector where there have been sort of new calculations that show that you could have axions with a wide range of masses that could all actually be potentially constituting dark matter. And therefore, there are new sets of experiments that can be designed now to find them. And it's, um, so there's some new uh, momentum in uh, trying to discover. So what I wanted to show you with um, some of the slides is that you know, invisible entities really lie at the core of our understanding of uh, physical phenomena, and definitely in terms of, the, uh, of our understanding of the cosmos. And they have turned out, invisible entities have turned out to be extremely important devices in the formulation of scientific theories. And I, I have no doubt that they will continue um, to serve a really important purpose. Let me quickly see if the laptop situation, are we, are we near any? Projecting right now. 
Pardon? It's the projector that's not working. I don't know what's going on. Yeah. But nothing. Is there any chance of things working? I think they've gotten a new projector, so. Brian, is there any chance of this chicken show we want now? Possibly, yeah. Oh, oh great. So, it's, you know, we can't give you a definitive answer. That's fantastic. We're, we're hopefully, in about five minutes, we'll have something ready for you. How about if we open up questions? Yeah, we can open up for questions, and then I'll show you um, uh, some of the slides. Why don't you recognize your own, uh, your interlocutor, interlocutor yourself? Please go. I And if, uh, if it's true that entities are real, mm -hmm. and if it's true that the universe is expanding mm -hmm. at the speed of light. No, no, it's not expanding at the speed of light. But it's accelerating. Yeah, the expansion okay. is accelerating. So here's my question. What is the universe expanding into? Mm. So um, <laughs> the, ex the universe, you know, one of the problems with the analogies that people use to describe the universe is you know, a balloon blowing into a balloon and so on and so forth. And they're actually um, inappropriate analogies. They sort of, it, stops, it stops being useful um, uh, after a certain point. The universe is not expanding into anything. There is nothing into which the universe expands. The universe is just expanding. And the way to understand that is to think of the expansion not in terms of the balloon, but just in terms of the distances between objects stretching out. And so do not really think of, of, an, of something with an edge, with a well-defined edge. We don't actually know if our universe is finite or infinite. We know that the observable universe, it actually has a finite horizon. And whether the universe exists beyond that or not is not something that we can answer, right? because we cannot actually get any information. Right? So I think you know, the same question of whether, you know, where did the Big Bang happen is another question that is often confusing. Um, um, and you know, I spent a lot of time in my undergraduate classes talking about this, and that's because we have this notion of the Big Bang being an explosion, and the conventional idea of explosion is sort of, you know, you have a point, and then you have an explosion from there. So the Big Bang actually happened everywhere. So if in conjunction with the Big Bang happened everywhere, because that was everywhere at the time, and the universe actually expanded, had a very rapid exponential expansion, But you know, I don't have the, the lights for that. But do you have your computer? Fantastic. Let's try that. No problem. OK. Um, this is great. So um, I think in conjunction with you put these teams, two things together, it might be helpful to think about um, the fact that the universe is not expanding into anything because it didn't really explode from a point either. I don't know if that's helpful. Oh. Hi. Hi. Enjoyed your presentation very much. Thank you. <laughs> Hopefully it's not done yet. No. <laughs> but, <yeah. laughs> two, two questions. Um, Please hold the mic up to you. Would you consider dark matter to be, in quotes, a placeholder? And secondly, um, is there dark matter in this room right now? Yeah, there is dark matter in this room, but dark matter, the density of dark matter in near the solar system, near, near where we are and therefore on Earth, is very, very sparse. So uh, there could be a particle that is going through here every 10 to the 5 years or so. So the rate is very, very low in a room of this size. I'm making a small calculation with uh, this room and estimating it. Part of the problem, one of the challenges in detecting dark matter is even if a dark matter particle goes through, it does nothing. It doesn't actually perturb, right? So unlike even um, an energetic X-ray, which we believe that you know exposure to X-rays will sort of destroy your cells and so on, you imagine you get your X-ray, dark matter particles will go unimpeded through any object because they don't interact conventionally with the conventional known forces. They have, if they have any interaction at all, we believe it's extremely weak extremely weak. So they don't couple to photons, so they don't interact with light. They don't interact with most other subatomic particles. They don't, uh, um, so the, we believe that the leading candidate, the sort of neutralino, these weakly interacting massive particles, we believe actually have a very peculiar nature. They don't actually collide either. 
they actually just graze past each other. That's how sluggish they are, and that's how uninteractive they are. And, um, but they do aggregate, because gravity, they have mass, so they aggregate because uh, they have mass. Good question. Yeah. Um, in uh, in um, the end of last year, there were, were several uh, papers in, serious academic papers in um, uh, <coughs> academic journals about that dark matter is probably only one of the theories and there is there could be a new gravitational theory that does not need the black matter and it's probably uh, some other people published papers on <coughs> that it's probably just errors in our calculations and we just don't have correct mathematical theories. So uh, sure. what do I you think about that. it? Yeah, so first I, um, I forgot to finish your second question, which is, you know, uh, science is provisional. So everything is provisional. So to, to that extent, you know, dark matter um, is a placeholder. Just like everything in science is a placeholder. It's a very uncomfortable concept for people who are not practicing scientists that, you know, everything is subject to alteration. However, you know, there is a fundamental um, you know, shift, a discarding of the concept and a new concept taking Sorry. over versus a, you know, the idea getting more refined. I think dark matter is really looking like something that needs to get maybe more refined, but it would work. It works? Okay, great. Yes, I don't need to see. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. So no, so um, you know, coming back to the question, so one of the alternative theories, because of the current sort of intellectual impasse with dark matter, we've not found the particle, has been a suggestion, a, a suggestion dates back to the 1960s by Finzi, which is that perhaps the laws of gravity stay altered, are somewhat altered, Newton's laws are somewhat altered in cosmic objects that, um, in, that, that there's a different regime when you're looking at a galaxy, because as I'll just talk about the evidence for dark matter, came originally from the motions of stars and galaxies. Uh, it turns out this alternative theory that's called modified Newtonian dynamics that you know, has had many avatars. So the more refined one is called Teva, Tevas, so tensor vector scalar theories that dispense with the idea of dark matter entirely and they tinker rather with the nature of gravity and the definition of gravitational force. So these theories work incredibly well in explaining the, the evidence, the dynamical evidence for dark matter, which is from the motions of stars and galaxies, which I'll just talk about in a minute. But what they cannot reproduce is another very um, uh, observed, important observed effect, which is gravitational lensing. So these theories cannot reproduce the light bending that we see. And so let me just, I think it might be useful if we now defer the question that no, exactly. I think I want to go through the slides very, very quickly. So now, yeah, I think I'll go through the slides very, very quickly. Um, so what, what, what I'm showing you here is our current understanding of the composition of the universe. And this is what I tried to describe, that the bulk of, the, if you look at the pizza on the left-hand side, the pizza slices, dark energy and dark matter, which are both invisible entities, form the bulk. And all the stuff that we're made of, everything in the periodic table, is actually that sliver of four-ish percent. And so the, the, the evidence for dark matter and dark energy, really, as well as black holes, actually, comes from the impact on dynamics, on the motions of stars and galaxies, and the impact, the bending of light rays in the universe. So first of all, to do that, you know, there's a reconceptualization of gravity by um, Einstein, which is relevant here, which is that matter in the universe will cause the structure of space-time, which is what we believe the universe is. Um, to have, you know, uh, divots or matter will induce these curvatures, these potholes in space-time. And the distribution of matter, the nature of the distribution of matter, how compact it is or how fluffy it is, determines how deep that divot is. Remember, there's nothing in the universe above or beyond space-time. So anything in the universe has to travel along these potholes that are generated by all the matter in the universe. And light does that too. So for example, if you look at a black hole, which is, an, uh, which is a dark entity, one of the reasons that we don't see black holes directly, we don't actually image them, right? Unlike, so it's not a question of a distant exoplanetary system, but if we had the biggest possible telescope, we could actually faintly see it. Fundamentally, we cannot actually see a black hole. But what we can see, because there are regions where even light cannot escape. 
because a black hole is essentially causes a puncture in space time. So the divot that is caused by the black hole is so extreme, right, that you'll never actually see it. However, there are regions around the black hole where light can get trapped and you could see the shadow of the black hole. And there's an experiment currently underway called the Event Horizon Telescope that plans to image the, this, the light shadow around the black hole in the center of our galaxy. So every galaxy we believe has a black hole. This is an animation starting from a real Hubble Space Telescope image down to artist conception on scales where we don't have data. So this is a region of the galaxy that is invisible to us because we don't have the instrumentation. So this is all made of ordinary atoms. This is ordinary gas, hydrogen gas that is swirling around in red. And the black hole is right in the center. So I just wanted to make the, um, uh, wanted to delineate the fact that we won't, we don't see this gas because we don't have the kinds of instruments that can resolve those tiny scales. However, if we did, we would see the gas swirling in. However, the black hole itself, we will never see. So there's a real difference in um, how invisible things are. I'll skip some of these slides and I'll just show you. So this movie is a movie from uh, all of the motions, the strongest evidence for the existence of a black hole in the center of our galaxy. So we, we do not see the black hole. We can never see the black hole directly. We indirectly see it because you can see the beautiful Keplerian motions of the stars, the stars right around the black hole. This is all real data. And this is a future projection of a gas blob that we could get swallowed once again indirectly, we could image the black hole, and never quite directly. And as you all know, the other invisible entity that was recently discovered was the gravitational waves, invisible gravity waves, so basically tremors in that fabric of space-time when two black holes merge, and the LIGO collaboration presented that amazing discovery. So I'll just quickly end with this other probe, which is the bending of light. And so that was you know, discovered um, and proposed in the 1930s. But the key sort of breakthrough for the existence of dark matter, the empirical evidence came from Vera Rubin and her colleagues, where they looked at the motions of stars from the center outward of a galaxy. And they found the expectation was it should look like the red curve, because you run out of matter at some point, you run out of gravitational, uh, the entity that's causing the gravitational force to run out. It turns out what they measured was the white curve. Something seems to be holding up galaxies even at large radii, right? So, so that led to the proposal of the existence of dark matter and dark matter halos, an ex extended distribution of dark matter piled in the center, and the light that we see in galaxies is a very small portion of what is really there. So just to give you a feel, this is fundamentally different from what happens within our solar system. Uh, where the sun is the dominant gravitational body. So if you look at the speeds of the planets, they decline as you go further out. Whereas in a, gal in a galaxies, you see the upper set of curves, the, uh, the speeds of stars in a galaxy are actually held up. So the mass distribution in our solar system, the way it's tilted in our solar system, is fundamentally different from what it is in galaxies. So in galaxies, there's an extended source of gravity that is distributed radially. So this is our conception of galaxies right now. They've extended dark matter halo, and you have a very small, um, uh, small, the small visible portion. So this is a, a visualization of the, the indentation in spacetime that is caused by a large agglomeration of dark matter. And that is uh, in a cluster of galaxies that are very, very massive. And what that bending does, what that bending the pothole in spacetime does, is you have light from very distant galaxies that we now see distorted. Their shapes get distorted because of the potholes that light uh, has to traverse in spacetime. So I'll just stop with the uh, showing you visually. So this is a region on the left-hand side. You see one of the deepest Hubble Space Telescope images. And here, in that image, there are many, many distorted galaxies that lie beyond. And in blue is a reconstruction of my research group's re recent reconstruction of the dark matter that is there that you don't actually see. So we're now in a position where we can make maps of dark matter. So I'll stop with this slide, where this is a representation of the inferred distribution of dark matter in this region, the blue stuff that you saw there and the ways in which dark matter is piled. So this is where we are at with dark matter. So it is like the analogy that I can give you, the best analogy is that if you can map, imagine you're on a beach, you have an aerial view, you can map all the sand dunes in exquisite detail and how they shift and what their shapes are and you don't know yet what a grain of sand is made. 
You don't know what the grain of sand is really made of. So that's where we are at with dark matter. Anyway, thanks very much for your time. This talk reminds me of a conversation I had uh, on one of my periodic visits to Caltech when I was at faculty club and encountered uh, an old friend, Mark Schmidt, who was a co-discoverer of Quasar back in 1960. And I said, make the conversation, well, Mark, what to do with the universe? And he threw up his hand and said, universe? Universe is a mess. <laughs> Precisely because of dark matter and the accelerating expansion. So I wish you were going to be around for the Larger, the longer discussion, because uh, one question I've got is uh, that I want to contemplate uh, is uh, do you do, do some astronomers, astrophysicists, cosmologists, how they expect that the resolution of these puzzles, these mysteries, will lead to new laws of nature, or whether they will be combinated by existing ones? So that's a big one that we don't have time for. But th thank you very much. Our, it's a pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Life Science Relief Association. Uh, she is uh, Molly Cummings, a professor in the Department of Integrative Biology at the University of Texas at Austin. Her research focuses on the ex external and internal mechanisms that drive biodiversity and animal communication traits. She combines environmental measures, behavioral experiments in the lab, and molecular approaches to achieve an integrative understanding of the sources and targets of selection for communication trait evolution. Uh, Molly Cummings has published extensively in journals including Science, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, Behavioral Ecology, PLOS One, Evolutionary Biology, Frontiers of Neuroscience, and so on. Uh, and her work has been covered also in popular journals by The Economist and National Geographic. And I'm sure that her talk will be as fascinating and compelling to us as it is for the readers of The Economist and Natural and Naturalist Geography. Thank you very much. And as uh, my talk hopefully is being loaded back there. Um, yes, so we're going to biology. So we're moving from invisible particles and invisible fields to the macro objects that are either visible or invisible. And I want to really thank Arian for this invitation. I've already learned so much. I had no idea that we owe our knowledge to the uncertainty principle due to uh, the humankind not yet inventing the antihistamine. So I'm very grateful that uh, Heisenberg had that hay fever fit and went off to those islands to figure it all out. Um, good, I, see, I can see my... Uh, talk, it's invisible to you right now. Um, okay, so as the only biologist as part of this panel, uh, I feel that it is my duty to point out that um, the quest for invisibility is essentially a very natural process, a natural quest that is shared by almost every animal in our, on our planet, and we humans are no exception. Um, when we, t there we go. So when we, do I just hit the green button? Uh, one moment. So when we, we classify animals, we often put them in either predator or prey category, but more often than not, we're both. Uh, we're in hot pursuit of finding and feeding on certain living organisms, while at the same time, we're trying to evade uh, detection by our own predators. And this has led to two pretty interesting evolutionary adaptations. Number one is animals across the board have evolved very specific reflectance properties or shapes and morphologies that allow them to match the background in very specific detail. Number two, it has led to the evolution of highly specialized detecting systems so that the predator can see and identify even the smallest difference between a target and its background. And this particular co-evolutionary arms race has led to the evolution of a real diverse array of detector systems out there in our animal world that are highly specialized to each and individual environment. Now we humans are no exception to this co-evolutionary process. And even though we evolved in forests and grasslands, 
we've come to a point in our evolution where we need to hide and see things in pretty much every environment on our planet. And so we've done a pretty good job of taking surface properties and matching them well to any given environment. And it's led to this evolutionary arms race of identifying detector systems that can still find those differences between target and background. And we've gotten to the point where, even though we are land-loving creatures, we still need to hide things in other environments where humans don't really spend a lot of time in. Um, oh, excuse me, I should point out that what we do when we try to hide things in environments that we're not familiar with or we're not blending in, in we, we take lessons from the animal kingdom. So we identify animals who are specialized to hide or see things in that environment and learn their, extract the lessons and try to apply them for ourselves. And we call that process biomimicry. Sometimes we need to actually hide things, and you can use your own imagination as to what things we might want to hide, in places where there's nothing to hide behind. And one of those examples is the ocean. If you think about the ocean, it's a, it's a purely or largely featureless environment where a predator might be approaching you from every single angle. It's very a 3D camouflage conundrum. And in addition, it's highly disorienting. There's no uh, structure to hide behind or blend against. So essentially, you have to blend into the water medium itself. Now, to our human eyes, this might seem somewhat simple. And, and decades ago, when the military turned to scientists to ask scientists, come up with a solution to hide our vessels or submarines in this environment, it seemed pretty straightforward because when you and I are plopped in the middle of the ocean and we turn to our right and we turn to our left, the optical world seems the same. It's homogenous. And so if that's the case, then a simple coating of our bodies with mirrors would be the ideal solution. Well, uh, things, and I, this particular simulation won't work on this computer, so I won't try, but um, that worked well enough when all we had to worry about was human eyes. We, we built things that simply acted like mirrors, and in terms of uh, brightness and color of light, that seemed to do well. But as our, our, the evolution of technology advanced, we actually started evolving or designing technology that could look into the light field beyond what our human eyes can see. And we started paying attention to one form of the light field that's known as the polarization component of the light field. And it refers to how the light waves are vibrating either coherently with each other or not, and the specific angle of that vibrational plane. Now, if we look at our planet Earth, there are two big, big giant in, uh, environments that have a great deal of polarized light. Both of these environments, the sky and, and aquatic worlds, are places that have a lot of water molecules. And water molecules scatter the light, create a vibrational plane in a very predictable direction. So it's not surprising that the rest of the animal kingdom um, has evolved means to detect this light field. Um, and so uh, what we've realized is that as, as countries started to use satellites with different kinds of detectors, if they put on a polarization detector on their satellites, they could pick up targets, and I'm going to see if this is going to work, yes. This is a simulation of a fish acting like a mirror in a polarized light field where the colors here represent different angles of polarized light. So as you might notice, the fish often stands out quite dramatically against the changing color background. And, and this is a simulation of circumnavigating a fish, a predator that was going 360 degrees around a fish. Um, and the polarized light field is constantly changing. So the left side of a fish is very different from the right side of the fish because the polarized light field is driven uh, as a function of the angle of the, of the main rays of the sun. So for satellite or detection purposes, any country who had a polarized filter on their, or polarization detector on their satellites could find things pretty easily in the marine environment. So what our country wisely chose to do is to fund a, an interdisciplinary project, including biologists like myself, uh, physicists, optical oceanographers, and electrical engineers, to go out and find the solutions that nature had already solved. Or, or problems that they had already solved. So we went out to places and found live open ocean fish that evolved in this environment. 
we would put them in the center of this apparatus against a mirror and then pull back and set our video polarimeter into motion and then we would collect measurements uh, circumnavigating the fish um, at different points a day with the sun at different angles, so at different polarization fields. Um, and with this giant multidisciplinary project, we started to find solutions. Um, and this, unfortunately, is a, uh, a one frame of a video of one of those 360 degree turns. Unfortunately, I don't think, yep, sorry, I can't go back. I, it won't spin or it won't run. But this is one frame, and this is actually a good frame to look at because what you're seeing is in the middle, that blo the, the, blue, the blue square represents the mirror. The pink colors on the other side, excuse me, this frame is a video segment um, as viewed through a polarization, um, prop its polarization properties, and specifically its angle of polarized light. So the side margins are the background light field. The blue square you see is the mirror, and that kind of oblong shape in front is the live fish. And what you can notice is that the fish is matching the background polarized features much better than the mirror is. And so by doing this, we, we came to the realization that fish have already solved this problem. It's a very complex one. And I guess my take home message today is simply if we want to become invisible, and it's a very natural drive for us to do this, we really need to look to nature to find already uh, created solutions. Um, so thank you. Smith comes at this issue, uh, this topic, from uh, yet another disciplinary angle. Uh, he is the James B. Duke Distinguished Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering uh, Department uh, and Director of the Center for Metamaterial and Integrated Plasmonics at Duke University. He is best known for his theoretical and experimental work on electromagnetic metamaterials. Uh, in 2006, uh, David Smith was with Sir John Pendry suggested that an invisibility cloak could be realized by a metamaterial implementation of the transformation optical design. Later that same year, his group at Duke University reported a demonstration of transformation optical design invisibility cloak at microwave frequency. His research has been published in numerous uh, scientific journals, including optics, photonics, science, applied physics letters, physics today, and the Journal of the Optical Society of America, and also Nano Letters. Smith is one of the most well-known researchers in physics and electrical engineering worldwide, having been recognized in 2009, and again in 2014 by Reuters as a, quote, highly cited researcher. I am myself eager to learn what a metamaterial is, uh, among other technical terms, in the work you do. Thank you. Yes. And uh, what's the same? Okay, great. All right. Uh, so uh, the, um, uh, I'm coming at this again in a, in a slightly different but related way. I heard a lot of things that are going to be relevant to, to the talk uh, that I'm giving here. And I thought um, just because uh, in a talk like this, it's, it's worth bringing uh, and, and celebrating the fact that it's been 50 years of Star Trek actually last year. Um, and that there's a nice interplay between science and science fiction that uh, sometimes science fiction gets a, a short shrift in things, but it is very inspiring. And I, I picked out this episode of, of the old Star Trek, uh, one of the earliest episodes called Balance of Terror, which was an entire episode based on an invisibility cloak or a perceived invisibility cloak. 
And it was very interesting because um, like any science fiction, uh, the technology in science fiction becomes a character and it has strengths and weaknesses and helps to drive the story. So, uh, and what I'm gonna tell you about, uh, in, even in our work, we have the exact same situation where we have a technology that has uh, strengths, a lot of weaknesses, uh, but is tied ultimately to science fact, uh, and that makes it interesting. So, uh, I'm, by the way, not an expert on invisibility. I don't think there is such a thing, and if there is, uh, they're probably crazy. But, uh, um, there's a lot of uh, uh, inspiration in literature and in movies about invisibility, and these are some ideas that have been out there. I don't really have a pointer, so I'll just have to kind of uh, go up and down, but uh, there's a, a few mechanisms. Uh, there's obviously magic, so you have something like Lord of the Rings or Harry Potter. Um, people can be invisible, that's fine. How do you go? It doesn't matter. And it's perfect, it's perfect, great. Uh, science fiction usually gets a little bit more interesting because of these weaknesses that help to drive the plot. So even in something like a comic book, you have Invisible Girl from Fantastic Four, or Invisible Woman, I, I don't know which it is, but uh, uh, there's actually some sense of a scientific uh, basis for, for that. And then in the uh, uh, lower frame there, uh, uh, there is uh, from the movie Predator, Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, uh, uh, um, really, I think, one of the best depictions of invisibility, uh, actually, because it was invisibility with this sort of um, uh, camouflage. It wasn't perfect, but it was good enough, uh, and it had some uh, uh, tie to some scientific basis. Uh, there's also the Invisible Man, and I'll talk about that as an approach to how one might create invisibility, uh, and then uh, other, other things throughout the uh, literature. Just a lot of um, uh, uh, interesting ways to, to be inspired. How do you do that with science? So to understand it with science, we first have to understand why we see anything in the first place. So on the above chart, I've got the electromagnetic spectrum, and uh, uh, really we see and, and we perceive because of our senses. And we know we have five senses. Sight is one of those senses. We have the ability to detect electromagnetic waves. Uh, and electromagnetic waves are light. Light is part of that spectrum. We see just a tiny portion of it from 800 nanometers uh, or billions of a meter uh, to about uh, 400, 450 nanometers, somewhere around there. Uh, that's where our vision is. But this uh, uh, region of, of electromagnetic waves, and a wave is really uh, defined by its wavelength. So if you're down in at microwaves, where we do a lot of work, your wavelength is a few centimeters. Uh, if you're in the ultraviolet, it's much, much smaller. You can't see that. Uh, and if you're in radio waves, it can be kilometers. Uh, all of these waves are the same from the point of view of electromagnetics and the point of uh, James Maxwell, who sorted this out at the turn of the last century. Uh, a wave consists of an electric field and a magnetic field. And when a wave hits a material, it causes electrons in the material to respond, and it exchanges energy with the material, and it gets scattered by that mechanism. So light at all wavelengths gets scattered, but we don't detect that scattering anywhere outside of our little, narrow, uh, visible range. That's where we see things. So when we talk about invisibility, we often think to our eyes, uh, but there are a lot of other sensors and, and detectors that will see things across that entire spectrum, and that's also important. So that's how we see. Uh, so um, you heard uh, uh, the discussion of what a field is. Uh, light is a field. If you have trouble with that concept, I was trying to think of how to explain it a little bit better. A field is invisible, uh, but you're very familiar with it. So if you think in the upper left of the wind, uh, just uh, blowing across a field of grass, you detect the presence of the wind because of the motion of the grass. So for a physicist, you might describe that wind as a, as a velocity field or a pressure field or something like that, uh, but you can surely detect that it's there. You, you're detecting that invisibility through the motion it creates uh, on this grass. In the same way, uh, if you have a magnetic or if you have an electromagnetic field, uh, the electric portion causes electrons to move in a certain way, up and down, as I'm trying to depict there in the upper right, and the magnetic field wants to actually make electrons move around in a circle. So that's our way that we can create material response, or that's how materials respond. Uh, they make charges jiggle around in certain ways, just like the wind will cause uh, uh, leaves or grass to, to move around, and everyone's very familiar with that. So uh, what is a material, then? 
A material, of course, is composed of a lot of atoms and molecules. All of these have uh, uh, electrons that are sort of bound. They can't go anywhere, but they can move and bounce around. So if you look at that, uh, you can see that you have these little responding uh, uh, types of, uh, we call them dipoles, but uh, you don't really have to worry about it. It's just they respond. Um, and we have two parameters in physics that we use all the time. Again, you don't have to know what they are, uh, but that epsilon refers to how much a material responds to the electric field, and that mu, that Greek letter, uh, uh, describes how much a material responds to the magnetic field. So the combination of those, if you want to control an electromagnetic wave, you have to control the electric part of the material and the magnetic part of the material. So that's my introduction to materials. That's all you need to know. Uh, materials come at you with all different values of epsilon and mu. In the past, we have not been able to engineer quite the uh, uh, spectrum of, of material response that we'd like to for certain applications. Metamaterials gives us that uh, capability. So another uh, note about the electromagnetic spectrum, since we're talking about Star Trek, I show uh, Jordi LaForge there. And the reason is because he has a visor, uh, uh, this, this uh, imaginary visor that lets him see across the entire spectrum. And just uh, to point out that uh, uh, you're probably very familiar with the fact that microwaves can image because every time you walk through uh, an airport detector, one of these uh, L3 machines, for example, uh, they, they are capable of taking an image of you just like shown there on the left. Uh, you have the same thing at terahertz. Infrared, people know that you can see heat signatures, and again, that's all because of material response. Ultraviolet can be used to see other parts of the spectrum where, where are very important, and of course, X-rays, as you know, can see uh, many things, including, uh, and, and, and can actually see through uh, the skin and, and tissue layers, so you can see bones and other uh, things of, of, of interest. So uh, we have an entire invisible world uh, that is opened up by, uh, various detectors and capabilities we've brought on by technology to be able to see outside of our very narrow spectrum. If you wanted true invisibility, we would have to be able to cloak something from all of those wavelengths, which would be a very, very tall order. And that's something that uh, if you watch the movie Predator, uh, you can see a very interesting interplay on that. I won't go into the plot of that movie, but it's, it's a good movie. So uh, free space is invisible. Uh, light traveling through free space travels in a straight line. And we believe that we're seeing empty space because light comes to us directly. So wherever it came from, it doesn't get deviated. So we believe there's nothing there. So that's invisibility. Uh, of course, that's a trivial kind of invisibility. If we have material, and it didn't come out quite well, but I had a little light thing. Uh, there, there's a little circle there. Uh, and it's, it's something like glass. We can still perceive something that's transparent because we have refraction. So light actually bends. And that bending distorts the wave, so we can see even something like glass, even something that should be transparent. Uh, ob clearly, opaque objects will scatter light, so light comes back, hits them. Uh, so we can see that scattering indicated there. And if we're downstream, we can see that something's blocking our view. So uh, there's a couple mechanisms for actually how we see. We can see shadows, we can see reflection, and we can see distortion. How could we actually create something that would be a cloak and make it look as if something weren't there, we need to do something like this. We need to take rays that are coming at us, uh, have some object there, distort those rays so they, they move around, and then restore them so that they look like they just came from free space on the left there. That's our goal uh, if we want to have true electromagnetic cloaking, not just camouflage, but, camouflage, but actually true invisibility. Again, a difficult thing, uh, but theoretically possible. So uh, the, the idea is not that deep because uh, you can see magicians doing this with mirrors. Uh, the same idea, I've got the bunny rabbit there and you have some light source. If you divert that light source around, uh, it looks like you're seeing free space. And that trick has been used to make uh, various types of illusions like you're seeing there on the bottom. Uh, you can actually make people look like they're invisible. Magicians are great at this. Uh, and uh, uh, the only downside is that it works for visible light, as you heard before, and it also really requires uh, you to stand in a certain place and look in a certain way, and often you need to adjust the lighting and everything else. It's not, uh, you know, as soon as you uh, deviate, that, that illusion is gone. Plus, you need heavy mirrors and stuff like that. That's, that's just not a cloak. Um, so, okay, great. Uh, some things just didn't show up on this, but 
Uh, we have a couple of ways of, with materials to control things. One is by controlling how much light bends. And that's given by this index, which is given by the square root of that epsilon and mu that I showed you before. Again, don't worry about what they are. It just means that control both uh, electric and magnetic properties. You can control the way light bends. Uh, and uh, we can also control how much light reflects uh, by controlling the impedance, which is the square root of this mu over epsilon. Didn't show up there, but that's, that's what you do. We have a couple parameters at, at our uh, disposal. A uh, common phenomenon of refraction is if you put a straw in water, you can see that sort of bending. Uh, and that's an easy manifestation of how you can start to think about controlling light. Um, so how do you make something invisible? Uh, the simplest way, and maybe what the invisible man might do, is to drink something and that would actually ch uh, change your impedance everywhere of all your molecules to match free space. Uh, and so this is a trick that's done here on the right, a little experiment where you have a glass rod, which you can clearly see because of this distortion. Uh, you put it in some oil that has the exact same index of refraction, and it looks like it's gone. It looks like it's disappeared. And of course, if you're in water, uh, a lot of uh, uh, things like jellyfish are mostly water, uh, so they're nearly invisible because they're so well matched to the uh, uh, seawater around them. So that's a couple ways of invisibility. If you did have anything that you could drink that would turn you invisible, it would probably kill you because it probably wouldn't be good for your cells because uh, they need uh, some of that uh, uh, scattering is actually part of the biological process. And so um, I don't think that's a very likely route uh, to get invisibility. So uh, how do you actually create a cloak? It turns out once you, you accept everything that I've told you that uh, uh, materials can control light and if you can control epsilon and mu, you can control everything. Uh, then there's a very elegant uh, recipe to give you the exact pres pres prescription of a cloak. And because we've had this nice talk on astrophysics and we talked about uh, uh, black holes bending space, in fact, you can imagine this uh, uh, just as a coordinate transformation. So if you imagine light travels in a straight line, just imagine that uh, you poke a hole in space and you push outwards, you distort all these lines, uh, light just still wants to travel along its, the line that it saw before, but now that line is distorted, so now it's gonna curve around. And we get this picture here, uh, which all we're doing is just uh, doing a coordinate transformation. We're just bending space. We can't actually bend space like that, uh, but if we apply that uh, uh, idea or that transformation to Maxwell's equations, we immediately get the recipe for a material that would accomplish that. Um, and I've written it down there. Again, you don't have to know what it means. It's just a complicated thing. If we didn't have the ability to create materials like we now do with what I work in called metamaterials, you might just reject that and say it's curious, it's interesting, but we're never going to be able to do that. In fact, we can do that. Uh, and that's uh, 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 able to at least bring the, the idea of this invisibility to reality. Um, so just uh, by an aside, this uh, showed up on Jeopardy in 2015. The uh, uh, answer was Duke University has developed a prototype for a cloak that grants this power just like Harry Potter's. And the uh, contestant got it right. It was the first clue of the show. Uh, the category was how innovative. And uh, the question was what is invisibility? So that was great. Uh, and the contestant won $200. Uh, so that, uh, that's, that's uh, probably the value of invisibility at the moment. <laughs> so what we do is, is I've told you about uh, uh, real materials, but you don't have to stop there because Maxwell's equation knows nothing about uh, real materials. All it knows is epsilon and mu. So as long as your little elements are much smaller than the wavelengths that you're dealing with, you can create a material and you can make it have properties that nature just doesn't give you. So this is just a little uh, depiction of how we do that. Uh, a lot of engineering now and how we make these things. We know exactly how to make a little atom uh, that will be, uh, um, uh, uh, have any desired property of epsilon and mu. And then we can put these things together and create artificial materials. Uh, and that's what we've done, again, as long as uh, these elements are smaller than the wavelength. And so, we did some experiments at microwave frequencies because the, the uh, uh, wavelength is about that big, and it's easy for us to make things that are about that big, and so our materials uh, are very simple to make. Uh, and this is a picture of what these materials might look like. These are my uh, colleagues, Steve Kummer on the left and former postdoc David Schurger on the right. And uh, this is actually the structure that gave us the properties we need 
uh, that, those little elements, that's metal, that's just like a little circuit on circuit board. Uh, we can take these things, cut them up, and make that little disc that you see there. And again, we don't see microwaves, uh, but certain instruments do, so we can actually detect them. And we can put them in a chamber like this, uh, where we can confine things, bring in microwaves, let them scatter around. And then at the top, we can put a probe, move that around, and actually create a map and visualize exactly, experimentally, what the microwaves are doing. So this is what we use. Um, this is a simulation on the top. We had to take some shortcuts in 2006 is when we did this. So uh, the cloak that we expected to see is on the lower right. And the idea is we're doing exactly what I showed you. The wave comes in. The idea is that within the cloak, the, the uh, beams of light get spread around. And then they get restored on the other side so it looks as if you pass through free space. If you make the ideal thing, it, it would absolutely look uh, invisible. Uh, what we could do at the time is what I'm showing on the lower right. Uh, and uh, this was our goal. And this was the experiment. And so the experiment is this sample that you're seeing on the right depicted there. Uh, and uh, uh, again, we're looking at the microwaves. Uh, the top is a simulation. The bottom is the actual experiment. And probably from a distance, you can't even tell the difference between the two. But if you look very closely, you can see like the little uh, uh, contouring from the actual sample. But otherwise, we created this hypothetical dream material that came out of this weird transformation uh, uh, optical sort of thing that actually behaved as, as had, we had expected, which was, which was uh, quite uh, exciting. So uh, it was also turned out to be exciting to a lot of people, and uh, for a while it, uh, it was, a, it was a, uh, an interesting story. We've gotten a lot of press out of it. Uh, the utility of, of this, we do a lot of other things, I promise you, it's not just invisibility. Uh, we're doing a lot of practical things, but it was such a, uh, uh, it connects to such a, uh, a concept that's so easy to understand and is such a, 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 a very strong science fiction concept. Uh, Dave Sherg there on the upper right, that was his third inter interview on Fox News uh, when he thought the uh, sunglasses were a good idea. It's a long story, I won't tell you about it. Uh, but uh, uh, it was just really a, uh, an interesting way to connect uh, with uh, real science uh, to some of the ideas that uh, we've all grown up with, or at least I've grown up with. Also, if, if the measure of, of success is, is uh, showing up as a little cameo on a Big Bang Theory, uh, we've been able to do it twice because you'll see on the left there's something about metamaterials that just was captured in a frame. And on the right, uh, I, I just snapped this as I was watching this because I recognize our, our own stuff. Uh, that they, they had our, our little cloak picture there. So I'll stop there, just uh, showing you a little bit of the hierarchy. There's obviously a lot of science and technology that's uh, uh, involved uh, in getting from uh, where we were to that point and where we are today. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Now, whatever scientific accolades you may have received, and there are many, I'm sure, to be recognized on big things. Big bangs here. <laughs> That's truly, as they might say on the Big Bang Theory, awesome. <laughs> so uh, we have four uh, really interesting uh, papers that come at the issue of or the topic of invisibility from uh, different uh, angles. Uh, and the floor is now open for general Q&A and discussion. I have a few questions myself, but I will hold mine off for later. Uh, yes, this gentleman over here on the right, and then the one in the middle. Pardon? You have one from before? Okay, fine. We'll start with that one. Okay. Um, I say thank you for all those uh, presentations. Um, I have a question specific to the invisibility. Uh, I want to figure out if there is no relationship between something that is visible and visible to the vision of somebody. Let's say something may be created, uh, you know that it's invisible, but, the, but for the fact or the way that that person has his vision, I, 
if it's possible that person see that thing you believe that is invisible, but invisible to that person. Okay, well, basically, let me, uh, let me try to rephrase it. Something is invisible. I ask, let me figure out if, I want to know if there is some sort of relationship to the vision. Let's say I have my, my own eyes. Maybe the way that my eyes, I assume, but I don't know. So that my eyes may be built a certain way, that's something that is considered invisible, but my eyes still can see it. I, I might. Uh, feel that at least initially. So um, there are definitely signals out there that are invisible to us because of the way our eyes are built. So David put up that electromagnetic spectrum and, and what we're sensitive to, and we get cut off at 400 nanometers. But there's plenty of animals out there who can see shorter wavelengths, such as ultraviolet light, and they communicate and create signals and they advertise things in the ultraviolet that we simply don't see. And some of their predators can't see it either, because there's costs and benefits to every part of the electric magnetic spectrum. If you're going to be sensitive to the shorter, shorter wavelengths, you're going to see all that scatter. And if you're underwater, that's a big fog. And if you're a predator trying to see something way in that corner, you don't want to have to see things through haze or fog. So a lot of predators cut out short wavelengths of light, and little tiny fish take advantage of that and advertise to their mates in ultraviolet. So it's a small example of where your eyes matter in terms of whether something's visible to you or invisible. Is that, it's probably not, you're probably talking more about hiding something entirely, but <laughs> it's one, yeah. Yeah, you didn't mention the word anti-gravity. I'm thinking of the Philadelphia experiment where the issue really was moving the ship Obviously, if it's been moved, it's not there anymore. It's invisible. But then there's this idea of the code of invisibility. So are they two separate things that they're considering in that? Or is it one thing? It seems to be two. The movement would make it invisible in the spot. But the cloak is also an invisibility veil. Yeah, I, I, those are separate things, I think. The, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, <coughs> Yeah, certainly not an expert on the Philadelphia experiment, but the, uh, uh, yeah, so there, there's more I could say about that, but there, there's sort of a, the idea of um, a lot of science fiction uh, concepts revolve around the idea of actually warping space. And if you actually warp space, there's a lot more that you can do. That's the Star Trek universe. The problem with that is that we don't know how to create and harness and control that much energy that would be required to actually physically warp space. Um, that is the Star Trek universe, and, and it's a valid science fiction concept, but uh, we don't know how to do that yet. And what I showed is, is nothing like that. Ours is, is more uh, uh, strictly operating on the electromagnetics. The uh, question I have, uh, you were talking about the fact that vision is limited in terms of the, the various wavelengths. And then you spoke about um, being able to add some, some energy or something else to change things. And I was just wondering why you can't add a particular wave that will translate it out of the visual domain, why you can't move things from the visual domain by putting some energy into it so that it's just moved outside of the visual range, let's say to infrared or whatever, and then people can't see it. So why is that not the way to go for invisibility? Uh, because we'd see the shadow. So. Um it, that's the way I would look at it. So, for instance, if you had a, ma and I want to make it clear, what David's group has made major great breakthroughs in being able to bend light around um, part of our small objects. But uh, right now, you guys are down to three or four centimeters, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and a lot of the rest of us are bigger than that. So it's a lot. As he pointed out, it's hard to move energy over big distances. So we can't get macro objects yet. But let's just take the example of the fish. Let's say. You've got a fish that's about a foot long, and it doesn't want to be seen. And it's like, OK, I, I'm reflecting light from 400 to 700 nanometers. What if I went into the infrared and just absorbed all the light in the 400 to 700 and just reflected the infrared? Well, the problem is, because it was abs absorbing in the visible, it would be different from the background in the visible. And our eyes would see that as a black shadow. So it has to match still the spectrum of light that everyone else sees. 
um, and either match it in, in, in the natural world so far, we've seen more background matching than invisible cloaking. Although it'd be really, I don't know, I mean, I bet you there are small zooplankton out there who probably use the cloaking um, properties, possibly. I'm just throwing it out there, um, as a, in addition to transparency. But um, uh, so that is why. You'd end up having a shadow regardless, because you'd still have to deal with the spectrum of light that the rest of the world was looking at. Yes. Uh, back there. Yes, you. Can you speak to... Um, a little uh, louder, please? Or sorry, can, is that better? Uh, closer, yeah, thank can you. you speak to how um, your work with metamaterials will be working um, in terms of cloaking larger objects, things that aren't um, infinitesimally small? And uh, I mean, because isn't that the next step? Isn't that what we're you yeah. know, kind of all waiting for and hoping for? Yeah, so the, um, the, the like I said, there's uh, every technology has strengths and weaknesses, and one of the serious uh, weaknesses is the fact that if you play this game of routing light like this, uh, and you want it to appear to have gone like that, that means it has to go faster than the speed of light. And if that, uh, you, you can do it, but you can only do that really at one frequency. Uh, you can't do it over broad frequencies because then information would have to go faster than the speed of light, so you can't do that. So that means, number one, these cloaks are always narrow in bandwidth. It uh, means you can cloak like red. Uh, you couldn't cloak red, green, blue. There's other tricks you could play. Uh, and the other is that uh, these materials, all materials tend to absorb energy. So if we were to scale this up, uh, and especially if we were to go towards the optical or anything to, to where, where materials become even more lossy, uh, then it would really just absorb everything. It would it would really uh, do what we want. I will say we have scaled this up at microwave frequencies to cloak large objects, and there are certain applications, uh, certain antenna applications, uh, where you're happy with just a narrow bandwidth. And we've actually been able to make things that uh, uh, could be useful in, in different projects. Uh, but the Harry Potter cloak, or the, uh, the type of cloak that uh, um, stimulated a lot of interest around 2006, when all the media became fascinated, I think is a ways off. Yes, over here, and then this woman in the front. Hi, this is for uh, Molly. Um, I'm slightly red-green colorblind. Could you explain a little bit more about colorblindness, and is it can it be cured, or what's the mechanism? <laughs> Not yet. Well, I'm I mean, sure that, that's future. a factor in terms of seeing things that are invisible, right? I right, can't, absolutely. You know? So real quickly, humans, we are trichromatic. We generally, most of us have three different photoreceptor cone classes. And one's in the blue, and then we have one in red and green. And the red and green opsin gene hang out on our X chromosome, or they're, so they're sex linked. And the reason why men tend to be more often colorblind than females is because you might have one year, you only have one X chromosome. <laughs> so one of your X, you're missing one of the genes. So you only see, you see the red and green differentiating very poorly. Red and green are really misnomers when they come to our photoreceptors because they're essentially a pseudo, uh, a replication of the same gene. And so they have really similar properties. And if we were to be accurate in naming them in terms of their peak absorptance properties, we would call them green and yellow green. Um, they're only differentiated by about, you know, 30 nanometers, which in the spectrum is not much. So I'm not sure which one you have, but uh, that's why you have difficulty telling the differences, because the rest of us can take our green and our yellow green and, and compare the slight difference in absorptions of photons. So yeah, things are invisible to you in the color realm that aren't invisible to others, but they actually found out, I think it... <laughs> Right, and I think in World War II they recognized that um, some dichromats actually had an advantage in certain parts of the spectrum so they could pit break camouflage where the rest of us were being distracted by the certain colors. So there's advantages to every kind of combination. Is there anything being done in gene therapy? Well, that's what I was thinking when you said, can I be cured uh, or can we be cured? I, I'm sure we're going to be start, start seeing insertion of the right ops, or you know, 
whatever complement of options that we would want. Um, the retina is the fastest, metabolically most active tissue in our body. And so you, you could insert through gene therapy uh, a gene for that, but you'd want to do it um, at an early stage in child development so they can rig up the rest of the pathway in the brain going all the way back to the visual cortex. Um, at this point, you probably won't want to mess with that, but you never know. <laughs> yes, over here. Um, it's, uh, thank you very, uh, very much for two great presentations. And um, my question will be about um, uh, evolution. Uh, you mentioned evolution several times, and you talk about evolutionary arm race and show it uh, and show eyes on the screen but eyes and ears they are not arms they are tools and it's like justification that evolution is very violent also claws actually uh, arms and but my question is that um, recently i read an article in bbc about um, nomads, uh, tribes, nomads, uh, tribes, yes, nomads, tribes in, uh, who lives in desert. And they have much bigger uh, vision um, spectrum. And they see what we don't see. And actually, and, uh, after that, I saw an article about that, uh, especially students right now became nearsighted. And we have uh, smaller and smaller eyes uh, range, and our technology actually um, investing not in our capabilities of see more, but see less. Could you comment on this? It's the question to both. Sure, I'd be happy to. So evolution works on whatever feature that organism has to give it an edge. And if evolution, if your detectors, they are a tool, you're absolutely correct, they're not on arms, but if they are a tool that enable a predator to see their prey better, then evolution is gonna act on optimizing their detectabilities. Same, similarly, if evolution, the prey, the animal that's being sought after by this predator, if it has a mutation that allows it to detect its predator better, that prey is going to um, evolve that particular feature. So there are, for instance, to get out of the world of vision and go into audition, there are bats that use sonar uh, for electro, uh, uh, echolocation to find their prey. And they're flying at night and they're sending out uh, essentially pulses of sound waves. And they use that the echo to find them. So there are little, what they eat is little nocturnal insects like moths. Moths have no reason to have ears, but they've evolved ears, and they've evolved ears on their wings so they can pick up, and they're only sensitive to these high ultrasonic uh, frequencies of sound, and they can use that detection to evade uh, a bat. And, they, and there's many, many instances where evolutionists act on the detector to allow it to get one up on, and I consider a co-evolutionary arms race between predator and prey. So, sorry for the general. In, in the back, yeah. Hi, uh, can you both speak about like the applications of these technologies um, and how this relates to certain military regimes? Because Molly was mentioning before that this could be used like by submarines, etc. So, can you please speak about this a little bit? Can you repeat the question? I, I'm sorry, I couldn't understand it. So I was wondering like, if um, what they would look like to see uh, their technology is being applied, and what is the relation to uh, certain military regimes that can be, um, where these technologies can be very useful? So uh, the, um, the idea of camouflage is, is pretty clear, and in every spectral band, uh, the idea of uh, making something less detectable is of interest. Um, so uh, I think I'll let Molly talk more about that because uh, uh, the techniques of, of camouflage are, are better and, and much uh, uh, more viable than this, this sort of spacey idea of uh, uh, diverting rays. But um, uh, there's certain, you know, the military has a lot of needs, uh, including communications, just everything that we have in, in normal life, the military also has a parallel need. And communications is one, and there is a, a lot of situations where um, you might want to com communicate around something and, and make it invisible to your communication so it doesn't interfere. 
Uh, and so it's possible to, with the materials we have, wrap something uh, such that it would remove it from the line of sight of your communications, not from your eyes, uh, but from the uh, uh, you know, devices that are communicating with each other. So that would be one use of, of, of the types of things that I've shown you. Yeah, so um, I want to be careful about my answer. So, <laughs> so that project that I, I shared with you about polarized camouflage, that was actually funded by our military. And it was funded under a branch of funding in the Department of Defense that is for basic research. And I think it's wonderful and very wise of our military to fund basic research. One of the features of funding basic science is that they're very clear that we do not make a direct connection to application. So I'm not allowed to actually say what this might be used for, but I think we can all make that, that leap. And um, I, the military, in their wisdom, has always actually turned to basic science to find first principles. And there's numerous examples where basic fundamental insight, I believe the microwave was one of those inventions uh, funded through basic research. Um, but David brings up a wonderful point about, and first, I also want to point out that as a biologist, I may have been helpful in identifying the neat strategies these fish take. But what we found, and we then went to the lab and figured out how they had their aridophores placed specifically in their skin to make this happen. But we could take those findings and hand it off to someone like a metamaterial scientist who can then think, okay, what materials, or properties of man-made materials do we have that we could link together to maybe recreate this highly specialized polarocryptic surface. So it's really a team of different scientists with different disciplines that can help society make the materials we need. But um, I love the point that David brought up about how we might, military and otherwise, might want to have very unique communication um, outlets. Polarized light is a perfect example of that. So polarized light is so angular dependent that you could be uh, communicating with your reflectance in one direction and sending off a private communication signal um, using polarized light in another or very specific narrow angular distribution. So it's, it's a way to not broadcast in every angle or every direction your signal, but very uh, have it highly discrete in a specific direction and potentially to a specific viewer. I'd like to intervene myself with one or two questions. Uh, first, the, the sort of unstated premise of your talks and Priya's is that instruments have become available that enable this research without everything that you mentioned, the, 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 the instruments themselves, you wouldn't be able to do what you do. So I wonder if you would comment on the uh, importance of instruments in this kind of work. Uh, and secondly, uh, whether uh, in the work that you're familiar with, you could make the following kind of distinction. There are two, at least two kinds of instruments uh, that uh, enable, uh, that have been in, created in connection with doing science. Uh, one is an instrument that is created for a particular purpose, but then opens up lots of other areas of work. A telescope, for example, would be a, a, a good ancient example, or uh, uh, nano laser uh, chemical uh, analysis of uh, chemical reactions uh, for which my friend, late friend uh, Ahmed Zawail at Caltech won a Nobel Prize. So that's, there's that kind of instrument. But then there are instruments that seem to be in, that seem to be characterized in your work, especially yours, David. Uh, that are intended to, uh, um, so to speak, uh, develop applications rather than open up new branches of knowledge seeking. So uh, is that a phony distinction, at least in your experience? But before we get to the distinction, uh, would you comment at least on the uh, development of these instruments and where they come from and how you manage to uh, uh, get hold of them? Do you develop them, invent them yourself? You, it seems to me, David, does a lot of that, uh, David and your colleagues, but I'm not sure about you. So I think it's a, a valuable uh, uh, and, and hidden, so to speak, <laughs> invisible, if you will, uh, uh, feature of the research concerning in, in invisibility. 
Right, so um, I'll just quickly say something about that and then you can expand. So absolutely the, okay. So polarized light and what it's doing, people have been thinking about this since the 1940s and earlier, but they didn't have the technology to really measure it well. And actually the first marine scientist, Talbot Waterman, who was at Yale University and I had the good, a great honor of meeting him, he was the godfather of polarized light. He did his first work in describing the polarized light field with a series of polarization filters in front of his scuba mask in the Bahamas. And despite that crude technology, he was pretty darn good at, at characterizing the underwater light field. Um, this work right now, we built, a, there's no off-the-shelf video polarimeter, and I teamed up with an astrophysicist to make this happen. And what's neat is, in a lot of sciences, we're blending expertise to make major breakthroughs, and they're at the interface of different disciplines. So this astrophysicist, who actually was a true biologist at heart, his third year of his PhD in astrophysics, came to me and, and said, um, I hear you're a sensory ecologist. I have these really neat beetles. They reflect circular polarized light. I want to know if they can see it. Now, circular polarized light is one level more of the complexity than what I was describing. It's how that coherent polarized vibrational plane goes off in a circular pattern in a left or right uh, orientation. And there's only a few animals on this planet that even do this. And the question is, is it just a random byproduct or is it meaningful directed evolution type of thing? And so we did this experiment and sure enough they could see it. And so because Parrish Brady had that interest, we built our video polarometer with the ability to see circular polarized light as well. And what's intriguing to me is opening up a whole new field of potential mechanisms to camouflage in the circular polarized realm as well. And I think I'll just stop there and let you. So in, in, in our research, uh, the um, reality is that uh, there are certain markets that drive the development of, of instruments that, that we then use. Uh, when science creates instruments, they're usually expensive because they're so specialized. Um, the military has been a great driver in all things microwave. And we use that equipment uh, now, which has become very affordable, not, not super affordable, but uh, uh, it is, continues to drop in price uh, because there's just so much need for communications and radar and everything else at those bands. And those needs, uh, there's also a market pull, uh, just consumer markets. And one of the greatest areas to look at now is uh, the, the, um, the strong desire for self-driving cars. If you're going to have self-driving cars, um, these cars, yeah, they might need to see in the visible, but they also need to see in microwave bands because visible does, doesn't tell you everything, and they may need to see in IR, and they may need to see in, in bad weather. And so that drives a lot of instrumentation detectors, uh, uh, sources, all of which we can then use in, in, our, in our labs uh, to, to do other things with that maybe they weren't intended for, which is exactly what we did. So that interplay between instrumentation uh, if, if there was a real driving scientific purpose, and, and NASA is a great agency to look at because they develop incredible uh, uh, equipment, just uh, what you saw in some of the other talks to be able to look at galaxies and things like that. But uh, uh, clearly, we want to see the unseen, and that requires a lot of instrumentation to go beyond what our own senses can, can perceive. Yeah, the, the military has been an enormous driver scientific and technological development. And, and just a little corrective, the microwave, you meant the oven? Like when you mentioned the microwave? Yes, the microwave yeah, oven. That, that didn't come out of basic research. It came out of World War II research on microwave yeah. radar. But it did involve a lot of basic research because the British invented this tube called a magnetron, which would generate centimeter wavelength radiation at high energy, which is what everybody was looking for. The smaller, I mean, the higher the frequency of the radiation, the more precise precisely you can see what you want to see. Uh, and they didn't understand how it works, so they had to do a lot of research on trying to figure that out to improve. So the technology preceded the knowledge, the way the, uh, the steam engine, for example, preceded the knowledge of thermodynamics. Thermodynamics, we know it came out of the steam engine rather than generating the steam engine. So there's a symbiotic relationship, uh, and it's all interlaced, and as your own work uh, shows, as David mentioned, uh, uh, with the military system, uh, and uh, with the uh, commercial system, uh, and with the university system, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the context in which all of this goes on 
uh, is very visible, though not as visible as uh, we would like to know. I have a, one other uh, question. Uh, it's a pro my, I take my job in part not to moderate only, but also to be a provocateur. And that is uh, to uh, raise a question that's generated or stimulated in my mind by my friend Jerry Holden's paper uh, on that well, there's some things we can never know. That is, for example, um, the uh, exact position and momentum of a particle. What does it matter? Okay. There are lots of areas of science and technology where we don't care whether we can know the ultimate dynamics of nature at the most uh, micro level. Right? Your research certainly exemplifies that. The brain is an area where it doesn't seem to count. Uh, uh, genetics is an area which is you know, reductive, but also reductive to, uh, not to uh, uh, the levels of, of uh, delta P times delta M that, uh, uh, that, that matter. So. Uh, is this a uh, this something that is uh, that is a? I wish Jerry were here to respond. Uh, but is it something that is uh, some, uh, a subject for a cocktail conversation of interest uh, intellectually, or does it really uh, you know? And, and where are we with respect to the Greeks? Uh, but or is it uh, simply or is it something more profoundly important? Uh, in the scheme of all the things that we would like to know about, which are currently invisible, uh, but that the uncertainty principle will not prevent us from learning. And other things may prevent us from learning, like consciousness, but the uncertainty principle is not really, doesn't figure in that. I think there's a, um, a, it, there's a certain truth to the fact that whenever you have something where you don't know the answer, uh, it's because you don't, even if you never understand that thing, it just means that there's more you haven't discovered. And quantum mechanics is a great, uh, a lot of people have given up on trying to understand quantum mechanics, but it, it still is, is, is pressing on everyone that we still don't understand something about that. And just like the question as to what is the universe expanding into, it's not answered. And it well, that's a, we, it's a limitation of our minds that we have to think of it that way. Well, we have to keep... Right. We have to expand into something. No, yeah, maybe or maybe not, but I, I think it, 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 it's what drives us. And, and every time in, in our own research when we found something that we don't understand and maybe it's not you know, on the critical path for us, you know, we come back to it because usually that, that opens up something more. So everything that you don't understand is still worth looking into. It's a question of priority, but uh, I think it's just the natural drive to, to keep exploring that uh, those things are still useful that we don't know. Yeah, I think that's a, I just want to take that question into the biological realm and, and definitely applaud the, uh, the, the drive for curiosity and understand um, basic questions of science. And you just never know where it might lead. And I, I'd like to share a little example of that that's dear to my heart because I, I originally come from the state of Wisconsin, which had a famous um, senator named William Proxmire who used to give out this award called the Golden Fleece Award to uh, scientists who received federal fundings that he thought were a big waste of money. And one year he gave it out to a group um, that would probably be similar to what I do, to uh, scientists who looked at the mating signals, communication signals of marine um, squid that were using bioluminescence to communicate with each other. And he thought this was a giant waste of funds. Well, it ends up um, karmically that about 15 years later, um, uh, Senator Proxmire had a had a successful open heart surgery. He survived, which is really wonderful. And in the process, they used some biofluorescent uh, markers that came originally, or you know, you can follow the line back to this original research that tried to understand uh, fluorescence and bioluminescence in the, in the ocean. So you just never know when people go out and, and understand basic rules in, in science how it might come back to help us. Um, and that doesn't have to be your motivator, but eventually it can actually come back to help society at large. Tell that to the current administration. <laughs> <laughs> Erin, you want me to bring this to a point? Pardon? Okay. I want to thank our speakers, present and absent.